All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this early morning um, here for the MPG Primer. So I'm Geraldine uh, van der Hoera. You don't have to try to pronounce my last name. Uh, it's a, this primer is going to be about sequence data handling and variant calling. We're going to talk about um, how we handle whole genome and exome data um, for the purpose of variant calling, okay? Um, and I'll talk about several um, aspects, a few aspects of the data, how we process the data, how we handle the data. I'll also talk about the main variant calling pipelines uh, that we have, okay? Uh, feel free to interrupt with me with questions uh, at any point during my presentation. All right, um, the goal here, what we're trying to do is discover variants relative to a reference genome. Uh, when we talk about variants, we mean genetic changes uh, that are relative to a reference genome. We do everything relative to a reference because that gives us a common framework so that we can compare everybody's uh, genomic variation in the same uh, comparable way. <clears throat> so we're going to look at two main types of variation. Uh, there's the germline variation, which is inherited uh, through the germline. And then there's somatic variation, which is typically something we look at in the context of cancer. Uh, that's the variation that arises um, in the course of your life. Uh, but there are other forms of somatic variation that are not related to cancer. We just kind of focus on that because it's a primary uh, area of research for us. Okay, uh, the reference genome itself is a standardized genomic sequence that uh, is assembled from many people's genomes. Uh, so it's not one person's genome in particular. Although I will say that historically, the genomes, the people's genomes that went into developing the reference uh, tended to be from a fairly homogenous background, uh, of mostly white European uh, ancestry. Uh, so there's been a lot of effort in the recent uh, years, recent decade, to improve the reference and its uh, representativeness by integrating uh, haplotypes from populations that were underrepresented. And that is always a work in progress. Um, I'm going to focus on humans, but a lot of what I say applies also to other organisms. Now, if you are working with organ other organisms, uh, many model organisms at this point have a fully assembled reference genome available. Uh, but many still do not. And if uh, you do not have a reference, you're going to have a very hard time. And your first step really should be to make a reference and be a hero to your field. Okay? All right. So there's different types of genomic variants. I already mentioned kind of the categorization between germline, uh, germline and somatic variation. Now, in addition to that, we're also going to differentiate the types of events in terms of what changes in the sequence, okay? So uh, if we have our reference uh, sequence that's represented at the top, uh, we have these different types, right? The short variants, uh, point mutations or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, um, and indels. That's when you have a single change uh, or an insertion or deletion or of a few bases. Those are fairly simple. Uh, changes. Then we have a category that is more complex, copy number variation, as well as structural variation. Uh, technically, copy number variation can be associated or form of structural variation. Uh, and that's when you have additional copies of the a particular region uh, of the genome or a deletion of some copies. Uh, structural variation, you can have rearrangements, you can have um, here we're representing a sequence from a different chromosome that got translocated from chromosome 5 to chromosome 1. Um, and there's various different uh, forms that this can take. We are also listing here a type that's uh, a little bit different. Here we're talking about the presence of pathogen DNA uh, or just foreign DNA in the organism. Uh, that's going to manifest as a variation, but really is because there's somebody else's DNA in there. 
Uh, and I'm not going to talk much about that, but we do have pipelines now that allow you to um, identify and characterize uh, these sequences. To talk a little bit more about what that looks like in practice, uh, when we're looking for variation in the genome, here we're representing a portion of the genome in a genome browser. Uh, specifically, we're using IGV, uh, Integrated Genome um, Viewer, which was originally developed here at the Broad by Jim Robinson. And uh, at the top, to just if you're not familiar with this view, the top track gives you the depth of coverage, which is the amount of um, sequence reads that align to this particular area. And all these, uh, all these uh, gray bars here represent individual sequence reads. And so here we look at where they align to, and whenever there's colored bars um, or some additional symbols, uh, that means that there's, we've identified a possible change relative to the reference genome. So this, at this point, it's just the viewer, uh, the genome browser is telling you that the information here is different from what's in the reference sequence. Doesn't mean there is a real variant. Uh, we'll have to use some more elaborate algorithms to uh, determine whether that's the case. But in the meantime, we can already visualize and get a sense of what's in there. And so you see that uh, SNPs, uh, so single point mutations, are represented as these single bars. Here you have a very likely uh, heterozygous SNP. Here you have a very likely, um, also probably a, yeah, probably a heterozygous SNP as well. Uh, here in the middle there, uh, well, on the side, uh, this looks like potentially a homozygous SNP, okay? Um, then you have, let's see, we also have a possible insertion here that's represented with this purple um, eye. Now here we can't represent the inserted sequence. We don't have a way to visualize that, um, but this represents the fact that there's more sequence here that's in the reads than we can uh, represent. Um, if you have a deletion, you'll have just a little bar that looks like a hyphen. And then finally, you have these, these area when it looks like barcodes, uh, multicolored barcodes, uh, and you have a lot of them in a region. That can be just mapping errors, but sometimes when they're consistent, they can actually indicate the presence of copy number structural variation. And so that's why in that case, we're going to need some, uh, some software that can allow us to determine what's happening here, okay? All right, so in order to investigate these events and to collect data and find out what's, what's in um, any given person's genome, we're going to have two main types of experimental design as regards to the sequencing itself. Uh, whole genome and exome. I'm not really going to talk about gene panels, uh, but mainly I want to differentiate whole genome and exome. So in whole genome sequencing, we're going to try to uh, sequence the entire genome uh, with the caveat that there are some parts of the genome that are still difficult to sequence. And so in those kind of dark regions, we might not have uh, quality data that allows us to do variant calling. But for, for the most part, whole genome um, sequencing allows us to have coverage across everything, across um, intergenic regions, gene regions, and even within genes, we have exons and introns covered. And so that gives us a lot of information based on which we can actually do the variant calling. Uh, in contrast, and here we're representing variants, potential variants uh, with these stars. Um, in contrast, when we're looking at exome sequencing, uh, that gives us a lot less information. And the sequence data is uh, focused on specifically the exon uh, segments of genes. Based on the annotation that you're using, based on the kits, uh, the manufacturer's kits that you're using, they will have targeted specific regions, specific exons. Um, the difficulty there is that depending on, on the, the targets list you use, you may or may not have coverage everywhere that's of interest, um, and you may not always have the same targets list as, 
as data sets sequenced by other people. Um, and so when you're trying to compare exome sequences across groups, across institutions, that can, be, that can get a little bit difficult. So that's one reason um, exome can be a little harder to work with um, because there's that kind of heterogeneity in terms of what data is included in an exome. Uh, in addition to that, exome sequencing produces various types of technical bias that will confound the variant calling in several levels. And that's why from strictly the point of view of variant calling, we prefer to work with a um, whole exome, a uh, whole genome, sorry. Um, so we do prefer to work with whole genome. The kind of downside, it's a little more expensive, although costs have really fallen uh, in recent years. Um, it also generates a ton more data. Uh, you have 100 times more data in your whole genome, and so you have to have a plan to deal with that. Uh, that's one of the things we do, is figure out ways to handle that amount of data in a same way. Okay? So those are the main two differences. And the way that looks in practice, um, this is your whole genome data uh, on top. And you can see you have that kind of distant mountain range effect. Uh, if you're looking at the, the coverage track, just across the entire um, viewport that we're looking at here, we just have coverage everywhere, and it's fairly even. Uh, in contrast here, we have one exome target, which is clustered around um, a particular exon of a gene. And we see this very typical kind of uh, solitary mountain effect. It's kind of like your volcanic mountain in the middle of the ocean. Um, that profile is very typical. And so if you open a file of sequencing data, uh, of aligned sequencing data, and you put it through a genome browser, you should be able to recognize pretty much on site, based on kind of this, whether it's whole genome or exome. Yeah, go ahead. How far past the end of an exon do these reads mm. um, Yeah, so how far do the reads extend? Uh, it depends a lot on uh, the design of the, the baits that are going to capture uh, reads, because basically you have all the reads, and then you're capturing um, a subset of the reads and washing out the others. The ones you capture, it depends on how the baits, there's like little um, oligos really, that are designed, um, Typically, it's, I would say, 100 base pairs on either side, but uh, that varies a lot. Um, and also because people use different annotations uh, in some cases as a basis. That's why you can have difference, sometimes important differences in the amount of coverage that you get for certain exons. Okay? All right. So um, that's what we have to work with. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of different like, little bars that don't really add up to consistent signal. There's a lot of errors that happen in the sequencing process. Um, and so what we need to do is have software, have algorithms um, that are going to identify when we have something that's likely to be real versus artifacts. Okay? Um, the main software package we use for that is called GATK for Genome Analysis Toolkit. And uh, the team that develops the GATK, which used to be part of MPG, but it was um, used to nucleate a new organization within the Broad that's called the Data Sciences Platform, uh, they're responsible for developing variant calling pipelines for the Broad. Um, and uh, they also make them available to the research community in general. It's open source software. And right now we have uh, five main variant calling pipelines. Three in blue that are production worthy. So they've been thoroughly validated uh, and they're used in production, uh, including in the Broad's genomics platform. Um, and then there's a couple of pipelines that are actively being worked on. Um, germline CNV and uh, germline structural variation. But the goal is to have fully, fully, um, fully productionized workflows for calling variants of all the major classes, both for germline and somatic. 
context. Okay? Uh, these workflows are called the best practices workflows. They include other software beside GTK, uh, but GTK is kind of the main recognizable toolkit. Um, I have an appendix at the end of the slide deck, which will be shared, that lists the other tools like Picard, IGV, and so on, BWA, uh, that you can get for pointers if you're interested in knowing what else is in there. Uh, but I'm mainly going to focus on the pipelines and the, the logic of the workflows and the logic of the analysis for each of the major types uh, of variant calling workflows. Um, first, though, before we can actually do varying calling, we have to do some processing on the data because the data that comes off the sequencing machine is a big pile of short reads, and we can't use that right out of the gates for variant calling. So we're going to do a little bit of processing. Um, just as a reminder, uh, how we generate the data. Now, there was a primer a few weeks ago by uh, Niall Lennon and Mara Costello, which is on YouTube. If you missed it, uh, definitely watch that. They talk about the sequencing uh, technologies, uh, the current sequencing technologies, and um, kind of what's coming next. Uh, but I just want to give a little reminder um, so that we're on the same page. When we're talking about sequencing data, where does it come from? Well, typically, you get some kind of biological sample from your um, study participant or organism of choice. You're going to extract DNA or uh, RNA and then convert it to, by RT-PCR uh, to complementary DNA if you're doing classic RNA-seq. There's a lot of variation. There's specific uh, ways of preparing this, of doing this. But the commonality is that you're generating short fragments, uh, double-stranded of DNA, and you're going to do some, um, some preparation steps, uh, binding adapters, barcoding, and things like that, that allow you to uh, recognize where the sequence came from once you've sequenced it. So that first step is called library preparation, uh, and that produces a library for, of DNA for your sample. Okay. Then we sequence the library. Here we were showing a classic Lumina flow cell uh, with eight lanes. We're going to put some aliquots of the library in the lanes. Sequence, the machine does it magic. Again, I refer you to uh, Niall and Moore's uh, excellent primer on how that works. And the result is you get an enormous pile of short reads. So what do you do with that? Uh, well, first, before doing anything with it, it's useful to understand what's in it, uh, what is actually in the sequence data that we produce. The main three types of information are the sequence name, um, which can be generated differently depending on machines and center and so on. There's some information in there uh, that can be machine useful, but not generally human useful, if you know what I mean. Um, so we're mostly going to ignore that for the purposes of this talk. More importantly, the sequence itself, that is kind of the main thing we're looking for. So we have a string of letters, the four main ones that we all know, um, that represent that particular short read of DNA. Uh, and then finally, for each, uh, for each of these base calls, so each one of these is called base call, we have one symbol that represents the quality of that base call. This is encoded uh, in uh, a couple layers of code. It's using ASCII, which is a computer code, to represent a numerical value by a single character. And the goal is that we can have a number that is attached here, but because it's a single character, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's then easy for the machine to parse without a lot of difficulty. Um, not to get too bogged down into the technical details, but it's useful to understand uh, what that means, what that represents. Because these quality scores are super important. Uh, the quality scores are describing uh, the, the confidence of the machine it's in its own decision. When it's evaluated that a particular call is an A, uh, it's giving you how confident it was that it's made the right call. 
And so if you have a FRED value, FRED scale value 20, Q20, um, you have a handy little equation that translates to the machine was 99% confident. And it's a 1% error rate. So that might seem pretty good if you get 99% on a test score. Uh, that feels pretty good. For the machine, that's not great because it's sequencing millions, billions of these things. And so there's a ton of errors that sneak through. So having a really good handle on what the errors are is really important. Uh, because that is going to be part of the variant calling process. We're going to use that confidence score. Okay. So that's why we care about confidence scores. Okay, so at this point you have that raw data and you need to process it to make it suitable for analysis. There's a few different steps. Mainly you're going to need to map the individual reads to the reference. That gives you uh, what we call a BAM file. Uh, BAM or SAM file. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then we're going to do something that's called marking duplicates. Then recalibrating those base quality scores that I just um, emphasized. And these different steps are going to produce a file of data that is ready for analysis. Okay, and the whole point of this, aside from the, the mapping, which is obviously we just need to know which area of the genome this read informs us about, all the rest is really about um, compensating for technical errors to make sure that we don't over or underestimate the evidence for variation later in the analysis. Okay, so the first step, mapping, we have this big pile of reads and we need to know where they belong uh, in the genome. And so we are going to do some mapping and alignment. The difference I'm making here is mapping, it's like you have a very long sequence, the genome, um, and you have a very short sequence, the read, and you need to know where that little sequence belongs against the big sequence. Call that mapping. It's a global alignment problem. Then you have the alignment part, which is the local alignment part, where you need to know, once you've determined, okay, this read maps roughly here, I need to do an exact base-by-base -base alignment. Okay, so that's why I'm making a slight difference. But in general, people will refer to this as either mapping or genome alignment. <coughs> so this, and I'm not going to go into the algorithms themselves, but this is going to produce a file where I have mapping information. And it looks like this. This is how it's structured. So in my uh, SAM file or BAM file, so that, that stands for sequence alignment map or binary alignment map. The BAM is just a compressed version. If you've heard of CRAM, that's a, a, the same information that's compressed in a different way. All right. And yes, so the information is structured in this way. If we look at it, what did we have before? We had the read name, the read sequence, and the quality scores. These are all pieces of information we already had from the sequencer. Now what we've added through alignment is that we have the position where it maps, where it starts mapping. Um, it has a quality score, which again, we're really big into quality scores. We want to know how confident we are that the mapping is uh, correct. We have a cigar string, which uh, I do not have a slide on in this deck, but basically this stands for concise idiosyncratic genome alignment something. I forgot the, the R. Uh, somebody really wanted to, it to spell cigar. Um, and basically, uh, representation. Basically, this represents the structure of the alignment, not the content, not the base content, but the structure. So it's telling you there's 23 positions that match, and then I have um, six. Well, here I have an N, which is not very common. It's an RNA seq thing. Uh, that means there's a gap due to a splice junction. And then I have 10 more mapping. But here I could include mismatches or insertions and deletions. And that's how I represent how my read maps to my um, genome uh, sequence. Okay, so I've added that. And I've also added mate information. I didn't talk about this explicitly, but nowadays we mostly use um, uh, pairs, uh, uh, 
pairs of reads. Okay, so when we're sequencing uh, the DNA fragments, we're sequencing from both ends. And so we get pairs of reads, and we know that they're pairs because it's actually in their name. Um, and so that is useful because when we're going to do some of the variant calling, it's going to be useful to have that information. Um, and so we'll have information about the mate of this read. If you're doing single-ended uh, sequencing, that's typically a bit more old school, um, but then you will just not have anything in these fields, okay? Um, we do prefer a paired uh, design for various uh, reasons that I'll not go into. Okay, so we've added this information. There's a couple of other things to point out. Flags is uh, sometimes a bit difficult to interpret. It's one number that uh, encodes a lot of information. Um, I'll refer you to the documentation for that one, but basically, this is a way for us to encode in a very concise way um, whether there's a missing mate, whether there's um, some types of processing have been applied to the read, things like that. Uh, they're called SAM flags. Uh, and finally, the metadata here, any program that's processing this data is free to add um, information in this field. And so depending on the developer and depending on what they need to, uh, to record, um, they may choose to uh, add data in the metadata uh, section. Okay, so that's what you have in your aligned reads. And I promise not to go into a lot of detail into all the formats, but I find that it's helpful to um, have a sense of exactly how the, uh, inf this information is encoded because if and when you work with this kind of data, you'll encounter these things and they can be a little cryptic on first approach. Okay, so um, step two, at this point you have mapped reads. I realize this is the old version of the, uh, the uh, pipeline, so ignore this piece on the side here, but basically once you've done the mapping, we're going to do something called marking duplicates. And the idea here is that through various um, things that happen while we prepare the DNA and when we sequencing it, we sequence it. Sometimes some of the reads um, that are produced are what we consider duplicates. They're duplicates in the sense that they were produced, sequenced from the same fragment of DNA. Now we don't want that, we don't want to count them because they're non-independent observations. And so we want to ignore them when we're doing variant calling. We don't necessarily want to throw them out, but we want to be able to ignore them. And so marking them allows us to do that. And so we have an algorithm from the Picard toolkit that is going to allow us to take just one representative read from a group of duplicates, and that's what the variant caller will see. Okay? All right. Then there's one more pre-processing step. It's called base recalibration. And at this point, we're going to, um, again, uh, deal with technical issues in the data. I told you that the sequencer gives confidence scores to base calls. And the key point is that um, sometimes the sequencer is a little bit deluded about uh, how right it is. Um, and that's fine when it's random. You can deal with randomness, randomness is great. What we don't like is when there's a systematic bias. As in all things, systematic bias is bad. And so, because we know that sometimes the sequencer uh, will make, will have a higher probability of making a mistake in certain sequence context, we wanna make sure that we don't end up with variant calls that are similarly biased. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, apply a machine learning approach that will look at the distribution of the quality scores relative to some covariates like the sequence context and detect when, for example, um, and you'll have to trust me, uh, when I have the bar uh, here up there, I'm saying the empirical score minus the quality, so 
empirical score is what we measure in the data based on this machine learning. The re reported quality is what the machine told us. Uh, if we subtract that and we find empirical minus reported quality um, is high, that means the machine actually underestimated. And on average, it's more accurate than it thinks. But if it's low down here, um, that means that it is uh, biased in the other way. It's making more mistakes than it thinks. And so here we're going to have um, information that's inaccurate in a systematic way. Uh, sp specifically, if we have a C and an A, then the next base is most likely going to be wrong. And so we need to know that. Now that's not something we can say do model once and then just apply. It depends on every run. Every run is different uh, because this is influenced by small uh, manufacturing defects in flow cells, various things that can go wrong with the machines. And so every time we need to model for a particular set of data what's wrong in it and address it. We can't fix the base calls, but we can adapt to the confidence scores accordingly. Um, at that point, we're done if we're just working with DNA. If we're working with RNA-seq, there's one more processing step that we need to do because when you're um, sequencing RNA, uh, messenger, really you're, you're sequencing something that comes from messenger RNA that has been spliced. And so when you map these reads back to the original reference, you're going to have gaps. If you treat it the regular way, this will look like a massive deletion. When it's not, it's just because of a splice junction. And so we have some processing that can look at that and um, treat the reads accordingly. And that completes the pre-processing parts. Are there any questions about the data processing? No? Move on to variant calling, which is more interesting? OK, got it. Enthusiastic nodding. All right. So now let's talk about how you go from these aligned reads that have been beautifully cleaned and actually generate some variant calls from that. Um, let's go through germline short variants first, SNPs and indels, and specifically what we call joint calling. So this is the overall pipeline that we do. This is the pre-processing that I uh, just finished explaining. And this part, the central part, is the, the really important part, the joint calling. Okay? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the logic of joint calling for germline short variants before going into what the actual steps are. The idea is that we want to analyze samples from different people together uh, because that will empower us to uh, do a better job of the variant discovery. Um, we kind of start from the idea that a single genome in isolation is almost never useful. Now that's, I'm talking about research purposes. Uh, in the clinical context, that might have might look a little different. Um, but in the research context, you're always trying to um, compare your genomes against a population, uh, other groups, and so on. We're going to want uh, to use family or population data. Um, and there's a lot of information in having a group's uh, genomes. And now what I want to emphasize is that when you do this kind of work, you can't just take individual call sets, meaning sets of variant calls that were made for different people, um, because that's going to be fairly underpowered. What you need to do is a joint call set, which is going to take all of the people you want to analyze and do an analysis jointly. That gives you a lot of advantages from a technical point of view. Um, I think I'm running a little out of time, so I'm not going to go into the full detail. but. Uh, the idea is that from a technical standpoint, if we have variant information from multiple people, we can be more confident that it's real variation as opposed to a technical artifact. Um, it's also very helpful uh, because it gives us more information. Uh, traditional variant calling, if we do it individually, if you look at these two cases, you would not get a variant call in either case. 
these are two uh, markers, predictors of Alzheimer's. And in this case, we have sample A, comfortably home ref. Uh, there's clearly no variation here. This person does not have this risk factor. This person, we don't know. We can't say that confidently because for whatever reason, we don't have data in this area. And we want to be able to distinguish that. So joint calling is going to give us that. Now, in practice, the way we do it is that we're going to um, do the first part of the analysis per sample, uh, and that's for scaling purposes. So all the pre-processing that I talked about is done individually. Uh, and then there's a first step of identifying possible variants that's done individually as well. And that is going to produce a type of file, type of variant call file, um, that's called a GVCF, that has information at sites where we think there's variation, uh, like the one in yellow, but also information at the sites where we don't think there's anything, like the site in blue. But we're going to, we're not just saying we didn't see anything, we're going to say this is how confident there were, we are that there was nothing, no evidence in there. And the advantage is that once we have that, we can take the GVCFs from all of the people that we want to analyze jointly and actually uh, do the joint analysis and then output just the variation, uh, just the, the VCF, the variant call format uh, file for the cohort. Um, but this step is very scalable. It scales linearly and it's fairly easy to do at very large scale. Uh, and that's how we can do something like the Nomad uh, call set. It's very large numbers of samples, a lot of data. It scales thanks to this uh, GVCF workflow. Question? Um, how does the joint calling affect the confidence of uh, calling rare variants like singletons? Um, so there's been a, in the early days that was a problem, um, but that was addressed and now we're, we're not losing confidence on, on single variants. So we're not penalizing them as such, but we're uh, reinforcing our confidence of the ones that we do see. Um, yeah, but it is, the thing is, if it's a singleton that you wouldn't be able to call by itself because the, the evidence is not good enough, you're still not going to be able to find it. But if the evidence was good in the first place, you will retrieve it. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, once we have the variant calls, we're going to apply some filtering uh, techniques. This is an area where there's a lot that has um, evolved recently. We're increasingly using machine learning approaches. Uh, the idea is to be able to distinguish um, programmatically the after the calling and based on some additional modeling, what are the variants that are likely to be real versus the uh, artifacts because the variant caller is designed to be very sensitive, to call as much as possible, and then we have this filtering more as a post-processing step uh, to, to separate the wheat from the chaff, okay? Then we can do some additional post-processing if we have information from a population, if we have population frequencies, um, if we have family structure information, and we have genotypes from family members, we can do an analysis that takes that into account um, and will uh, basically allow us to correct some genotype assignments um, and, and give us more confidence in the quality of the genotypes. Uh, so I didn't really go into that, but the, the previous steps were about really calling the variants and saying, is there evidence of variation or not in this person at this site? The genotype is saying very specifically making the call of this person is heterozygous with these, allele, uh, these alleles. Um, but that can be difficult to do in a first pass. With this additional information, we can refine the quality of the genotypes um, and get more confidence, which allows you, when you're doing something like looking for de novo uh, mutations, if you've got a, a large call set, this is a, a real case. Um, there were, uh, for a particular individual, 417 possible de novos uh, identified from the raw uh, calls. Uh, 
then by um, doing the first step of taking that information in, uh, they were able to narrow down the scope to just 17 actual likely de novos that were more likely to be real, and then further whittled it down to eight high confidence uh, de novo variants, which then that number you can verify in the lab, um, 417 not so much. And so idea, the idea is to really uh, be more precise and focus the additional investigation on uh, leads that are more promising. Okay. And finally, there's additional downstream analysis that you can do, including uh, predicting functional effects of uh, the variants. Um, and that is something that uh, is increasingly included in the, in the variant calling pipelines, though it is also so, uh, a bit of a downstream project dependent thing as well. Okay. So that covers germline short variants. That is the main pipeline that we have. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of the other types of variant calling <laughs> with a bit less detail just so uh, you have a sense of what's out there and what's feasible. Somatic short variants. The challenge here is that when you have, and specifically in the context of cancer, uh, when you have a tumor that's growing, there's a lot that's happening. There's different cell lineages that are involving its evolution in, within a, a little microcosm. And so the problem for us from the point of view of calling variants is that you don't have just the, the usual technical noise and difficulty. You also have problems of the tissue is heterogeneous. Um, there's contamination between uh, unaffected um, cells and cancer cells and so on. And so we have a number of additional uh, steps, approaches to do to tease aside the, those effects and be, produce confidence uh, variant calls. The main two types of controls we can use in this context using match normal, so if we have tissue from the individual but from uh, healthy tissue, and having a panel of normals, which is just sequence from other people. The match normal allows us to subtract the germline background of the individual, and the panel of normals we're going to use to subtract just systematic noise, artifacts that are recurring in, uh, in many people. Just to give you a visual, if you imagine that in the match normal, though that's what the, this area looks like, we have several possible germline SNPs. And then in the tumor, we have these as well, they're not somatic, since we're also seeing them in the germline uh, sample. But here we have additional variation, um, and this is more likely a somatic uh, mutation. Now, this is not perfect because you can have um, artifacts, technical artifacts that for whatever reason happened in the tumor sample but not in the normal sample. Um, so having a panel of normals is going to help us uh, compensate for that. There's also some cases where there's a germline event but we were actually not able to call it confidently in the tumor. Again, in this case, um, having the panel of normals may help us identify that if it's a common uh, variant. And so the idea here is to weed out um, artifactual calls uh, that are not real somatic mutations of interest. So that's the, uh, the thousand mile high view of somatic short variants. I want to give you a similar high level view of somatic copy number variation. The idea with copy number variation is that when we sequence um, the sample, we'll have the same amount of sequence roughly in the same region in two different um, sequencing runs. But in the tumor, if we've got a part a region where we have an amplification, um, we'll have more coverage. Just uh, as a byproduct of how the sequencing is done, we'll have more coverage in this area because there's more substrate from which we're sequencing. Um, and so everything in copy number variation is about looking for how much relative coverage we have. 
so the key point here is that we're collecting the amount of coverage we have at each, uh, each region that we're looking at in the genome. But we need to normalize because there's various sources of noise that cause one region to have just more coverage than the other kind of systematically. And so we want to get to a point where we're able, if this is the, the copy ratio that we're measuring, um, we want, and each dot is a target that we're looking at, we want to get to a point where things that are not amplified or deleted are roughly on the, on the one line. And then if you have an amplification, it emerges um, uh, from the noise. The, there's several steps that are involved in making this happen to go from the raw coverage where you can't say really with any kind of uh, confidence whether there's any amplification or deletion based on this information. But as we go through these steps of normalization, uh, you can see that we can really tighten the spread and get to a point where we can identify um, these jumps in amount of coverage with a fairly good amount of confidence. Upcoming methods, stay with me for a couple more minutes. Um, we're working on germline copy number variation, um, specifically some of the challenges around uh, very short germline events, uh, copy number events in exomes. Um, and the GATK team now has an algorithm uh, that uh, does very similar in, in terms of the idea of denoising and segmentation and calling to what we saw for the somatic copy number variation. But it all does it in one step, which is nice, um, because you run it once and then you get uh, the results. This is still in development, um, but you can, if you're interested, you can contact us uh, online. Now, germline structural variation, there's a lot more complexity because there's a lot more different types of events that we're looking for. In this context, there's several sources of information we're looking for. We're looking at, uh, there'll be deviations in the size of the, the DNA fragments. The, the insert size, they're calculated based on read pairs. Remember, I talked about read pairs earlier. This is where they really come in handy. Because if there's, uh, your insert sizes are larger or smaller than expected, that means something was gained or lost somewhere. Uh, fluctuations in coverage, also very informative in this context. And split reads, when one read starts on chromosome one and stops on chromosome five, there's something funky going on. And so that is often evidence of uh, translocations or things like that. And so the idea here is to take all three types of signal into account in order to produce um, structural variation calls. And that is something under very active development. Uh, there is a pipeline available if you want to uh, kick the tires, but um, it's, yeah, it's still working on it. So that kind of gives you an overview of the different types of variant calling pipelines that we have. Um, in practice, you can, you can use these pipelines at any time. Uh, they are all available in uh, GitHub. Uh, they're open source, so feel free to uh, grab them and use them. They're written in something called Whittle. I'm not going to go into detail. We have a, another primer that's going to be scheduled for in two weeks, the last week of the year. Uh, if you don't make it that week, we'll forgive you. It will be on YouTube. Uh, Robert Joski on my team will give a primer that will uh, cover pipelining, including what is Whittle, how to use it, and um, what its advantages are. Okay, I'm just going to finish on this, just to tell you that um, within the data sciences platform, uh, we do a lot of things, including developing these pipelines, but also building infrastructure that makes it easy to run them without having to worry about um, the computational side of things, the, the actual computer side of things. Uh, 
we have an application, web application, that's called uh, FireCloud. This works on Google Cloud that is available to all of you. Um, and that will be a big part of Robert's talk in two weeks. The basic idea is it allows you to interact through a web application or through APIs, if you're that type, um, with a system that allows you to run all of these pipelines on Google Cloud without having to worry about resourcing and machine types and memory or any of that stuff. Okay? Um, and with that, are there any questions in the last three minutes? No? Comments? Requests? You just want to thank you. Thank you. All right, you can go have breakfast now. <laughs> thank you very much for your attention.